Well, hello, friends and familiars. Welcome back. We are on. Uh, we are doing our interview show today. We have a guest. So, welcome to the show, Brian. Hello. How are you, Brian? I'm good. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Uh, we interact on Twitter, and that's how we have come into contact with each other a few times as we... Uh, thrash creationists and intelligent design proponents around as well as through sharing uh all sorts of interesting science documents so why don't you tell everybody a bit about yourself just in case they don't know also we have peter he's our host and co-host as always we love peter in in the background uh, cool yeah hi yeah. hi peter uh nice to meet you um nice to meet so, you so yeah um uh, my name is Brian Gitchlong. Uh, I'm a biologist at, uh, well, I'm currently at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory um, in uh, New York. Uh, so I, I live in New York City. I commute out to Long Island where the lab is. Um, and I, I was a former creationist, actually. Um, I was a former young earth creationist. Uh, so I, I grew up in a pretty religious household. And um, I, it, it was actually like, my days as a creationist that got me interested in the topic of evolution like you know how you can kind of be obsessive about a topic even if mm -hmm. you don't don't believe in it or even if you don't buy into like the consensus of of uh, experts sure um sure and so i was uh, really interested in uh in in science and and evolution um and so i guess you could say like at, there, there was a kind of a time in my life where like i kind of wanted to like follow in the footsteps of someone like like Jason Lyle or Georgia Purdom. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, some you know like th th there was a time where I guess I my my goal or my hope was to like try to use science in like an evangelistic, bring people to Jesus kind of way. Hmm. Um, and it was in my undergraduate years when I was doing my uh, I was doing a bachelor's in biochemistry, and um, I started to, well, it I, I think it's pretty difficult to like get through uh that amount of science like where you're learning about like how genes work and how natural selection works and um mm -hmm. how fluid the dna molecule is you know how it can just kind of pick up mutations left and right and then they get filtered through natural selection like it's it's really difficult i think to mm -hmm. like uh complete like a science degree especially if it's in the life sciences uh with like your intellectual honesty and your young earth creationist faith both still intact. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then uh, after I finished, I went to Vanderbilt University and I did a PhD in evolutionary biology. Um, and it, it was kind of like at the crossroads or kind of like at the intersection between biomedical science and evolution. So I was in a, I did my PhD in a mitochondrial genetics lab hmm. uh, and uh, the things I was interested in there at the time were looking at what are the metabolic and the physiological, uh, like the phenotypic effects of mutations in the mitochondrial genome. Mm. And then how do those phenotypic effects give rise to fitness effects for the organism? So it was basically mm. trying to build a picture that like links the molecular side of genetic mutations to like, why does natural selection happen the way it does? And uh, yeah, so now I'm at a computation. So that was in a, a so more of like a benchtop experiment lab where I was working like on a microscope with organisms growing like in a Petri dish. Mm. And now I'm doing more computational biology. So I'm staring at a computer screen all day. Yeah, that's awesome. That's all really interesting stuff. I, I am really fascinated by um, that that approach by looking at uh, sort of the, the ecological effects of these, you know, molecular mutations, something very, very tiny happens. However, 
as a result of you know embryological processes and whatnot this is going to have a really big effect on the organism and even if it doesn't have necessarily a big effect it's going to have an effect which is then going to influence in some way how they interact with their population and with other organisms and so yeah that's it's all really cool stuff so um i suppose did you feel or, or do you feel i guess like um as a result of your background that now you have to you know go and uh educate um people to sort of in, in you know in case that they also come from the same sort of background as you right you feel like a, a fire to combat creationism because you uh, identified with it at one point uh i mean yeah I, I would say that there was definitely a time where that was true um mm. i i would say i've evolved a little bit okay. in the sense that like um it's, it's not that like i'm more sympathetic to creationism but it's not like as much of a project as it used to be like trying to sure. convince creationists that evolution is real um yeah like uh i guess for, for me, there, there's a lot of areas where uh, there's a lot of science illiteracy and and mm -hmm. um, science communication, I think, is just really important. And, and making science accessible is really important. So, like, um, when I'm not busy in lab, I'm trying to just, you know, work on my science communication skills. Uh, I used to do some some science blogging and, and um, yeah, I... I'm, I'm trying to, to make more time in my schedule these days for science communication, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's... You're busy, yeah. Understand. Life happens, yeah, and I, I keep busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's Absolutely. a really good natural history museum here in New York. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, there's, you know, natural history museums in a lot of big cities, but uh, those, if you, you know, if anyone's out there that, you know, that's listening or watching and hasn't had a chance to visit one, I would definitely recommend it. There's, um, there, there's actually, uh, so I went to the, uh, I believe it was the Smithsonian. Well, sorry, I, I get, I get the, the museums mixed up in my head sometimes. Cause like I've been to a couple of them pretty recently. So it's like, Oh, which one had the, you know, this such and such display. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a natural history museum recently. I think it was the one in, at the Smithsonian in DC, um, that, mm. uh, has a, a whole like molecular biology and genetics of evolution exhibit now, which was really cool to see because usually you go to those yeah. and, like the, the the big exhibits that are evolution focused are like you know dinosaurs and and um, you know hominid skulls, uh, but there's one about like how you know how DNA mutates and you know there was even a little display on like the genetics of birdsong like how you can mutate the foxp2 gene and it changes like the the song characteristics of the birds but that's awesome yeah absolutely case, sorry i'm probably getting a little away from responding to what you said no have have at it yeah absolutely i mean we're here to to listen to you so yeah uh with whatever you want uh there is a a natural history museum that's that's about three hours west of me um it's called yeah. the ross perot um museum and it's like a giant ah. cube building but it's you go up these escalators and so it's like you go to the top and then you work your way back down to the, the ground floor and it's it's really neat they they have just they have like a room with fossils it's one of the first rooms mm -hmm. um but then yeah a little bit later on when you go down there's like a evolutionary biology room but it kind of gives you just sort of the broad strokes of like natural and sexual selection doesn't really get too deep in it which is fine um but but yeah the the bit about the fox b2 that that is really cool that's really neat. Yeah. Uh, was it was it you uh, who somebody posted a picture recently of like creationists evangelizing outside a natural history museum? Was that you who posted that? Yeah, that was that was at the at the DC trip. So I went to DC oh. last week for a conference called the Paradox of the Organism uh, oh. conference, okay. and uh, I, I finished that. I had to you know kind of I guess celebrate the being there with a trip to the natural history museum, and yeah, there were some Jehovah witnesses outside that had like a little placard that said something like was life created. So I figured the fact that they were, they had a sign like that right outside the natural history museum couldn't have been a coincidence. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, what was that conference about? Right. So the uh, conference 
uh, well, it was called the Paradox of the Organism Revisited. Um, okay. And it was basically a reference to a quote by Dawkins. Uh, I believe it was a paper mm. from the early 90s by Richard Dawkins that said something to the effect of the paradox of the organism is that it is not actually you know what let me just um i can just pull it up uh real quick so let's see the quote is the paradox of the organism is that it is not torn apart by its conflicting replicators but stays together and works as a purposeful entity apparently ah. on behalf of all of them so not okay. only is it not torn apart it functions as such a convincingly unified whole that biologists in general have not even seen that there's a paradox at all Mm. Um, so it's basically about like how, you know, gene how and stuff. why do selfish gene stuff as well as uh, cancer mm. and, and various other types of internal conflict, you know, evolution of multicellularity, you know, how do you evolve a multicellular organism from unicellular mm. ancestors without like the, the conflicts between different cells within an emerging body uh, kind of tearing it apart. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a little bit of philosophy of biology. Well, a lot of philosophy. It was the most philosophically right. dense, I think. Um, there was talks on everything from like Aristotle to like mitochondrial genetics, and um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even in in your own field, like um, with the mitochondria, part of the reason we have like sexes is you can't have um, you know biparental inheritance of like mitochondria. One of the parents, one of the gametes, has to jettison its uh it's it's organelles as it that's right yeah uh so there's yeah there's conflict in that I was, i've been reading a lot about like sexual uh the evolution of sex recently uh your mm. secret project um and also the not secret project yeah secret project but also i guess not so secret stuff because yeah. i was also at the same time or for, well, part of the same time writing mm -hmm. a script for the channel uh, which was about sexual selection. Uh, we did the seal's tale not too long ago, which talks about sexual dimorphism um, and polygyny, which is all very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the other thing was like uh, between X and Y uh, chromosomes. That's another um, example of conflict because you, the from like the Y chromosomes perspective, it's not getting passed on um, in, and so there's that conflict between X and Y chromosomes and uh, uh, Matt Ridley talks about that in the red queen, which is interesting book. Yeah. If you guys haven't read it, read the red queen. It's a neat book. Uh, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I can't say I've read that. I do reference the red queen in the first chapter of my thesis because like it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard not to um, right. when you're yeah. talking about like genetic, uh, conflicts of interest um, are your are, are your listeners and viewers uh, do you think familiar with the red queen hypothesis because i'm happy to talk about that oh feel free like. feel free to explain yeah okay so um yeah so uh, it's i think probably something that people are most familiar with like in the context of like predator prey or um there's like also pathogen and host immunity but you know it's the idea that uh, there's different biological systems that have like mutually opposing evolutionary conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. And so that can introduce like these um, evolutionary, what, they, what are called evolutionary arms races of like adaptation and counter adaptation. So like in SARS-CoV-2 is, is like evolving uh, to circumvent host immunity but at the same time like our immune systems have evolved for millions of years to combat you know these viruses um, of course like the uh, cheetah is selectively breeding for faster antelopes because they eat the ones that they're able to catch and the antelopes are selectively breeding for a faster cheetah because hmm. they uh, reward the fastest cheetah with a meal even <laughs> though it's not intentional uh, right and, and uh, like, I guess uh, this is probably, I'm guessing, something that is talked about at the molecular level in, in that book on the Red Queen. Because, um, like, there's a lot of examples of genetic conflicts, like, within a single genome where, you mm. know, there might be opposing or, or mutually incompatible fitness effects of genes on different chromosomes within the same organism. Oh, yeah. Um, All the... That can also lead to Red Queen interactions. 
that uh, like epistatic stuff. Uh, yeah, or just different, you know, between different versions of the same gene yeah. too, the different alleles. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Competition's a uh, really interesting. Uh, there is a, and I can't remember who it was. I think it's also funny, however, that uh, Dawkins also did a lot of work on like um, evolutionary arms races. He's written some very influential papers on that. Uh, but yeah, there's a quote. It actually may have been by Dawkins on. Uh, cheetahs and gazelles and it's it's like you know yeah you that's kind of in, where i pulled that from yeah the intelligent design of like you know whose side has got on is it the cheetah or the, <laughs> the gazelle right yeah 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 but yeah you get some some crazy stuff uh, um like with um uh, ants and the uh, parasitic fungi like ophiocordyceps you get like mm -hmm. they the the fungus can only uh, sporulate in certain areas, like it has to be on the underside of a leaf, uh, and you know, yeah. during a certain humidity and certain time of the day, and all that sort of stuff. And like cuckoos and the arms races between them and other birds, and the birds being better able to tell their eggs versus cuckoo eggs, and and all that kind of cool stuff. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned um, mitochondria and the evolution of sex because, like. Um... Well, so, okay, so that's like a really, it's still kind of a controversial field, like why, why and how did sex evolve? But um, mm, there's yeah. like this really popular, well, I, I, I don't know if I would say really popular, but like in the, in the literature, there's um, mm -hmm. a view that's, that's at least taken somewhat seriously by a lot of biologists that uh, it was like selfish genes in the mitochondria that, because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like, the whole reason why, well, one of the reasons why why mitochondria are like a hot a hotbed for like selfish genetic elements is because the replication or the, you know the synthesis of new copies of mitochondrial DNA isn't tightly coupled to the cell cycle. So like every time right. a cell divides, it makes one new copy exactly of the nuclear DNA. But then like the mitochondrial DNA all around like the different parts of the cytoplasm are just getting replicated semi autonomously. And so mm -hmm. that can select for mutations that can lead to the proliferation of that mutated copy of mitochondrial DNA, even if there's no benefit to the host, right? And so that's kind of the yeah. general basis for why you can have these selfish genetic elements. And um, yeah. the, it, it's thought that that like uniparental inheritance, it you know provides sort of an evolutionary dead end for at least one of the two sexes mm -hmm. that come together to, to reproduce. And so, oh, maybe that helps to curtail the transmission of these selfish genetic elements into the next generation. Um, but it's actually more, I, th I think it's, it's so like biology is never that simple, right? And so right. There's, uh, yeah. there, there's more to it, but in, in my opinion, it's actually more interesting than that because uh, there was a, so, so there's a biologist at, I believe, University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, called Doug Wallace, named Doug Wallace, uh, and he was, he, he's almost like the Gregor Mendel of, of mitochondrial genetics. Uh, he was like the first person to, back in, I want to say it was in the late 80s, uh, discover one of, uh, I, I believe he was the first person to discover a disease-causing mutation in mitochondrial DNA. So like, okay. it kind of led to the, the realization in the field that, oh, this is a you know, these molecules of mitochondrial DNA actually have like important phenotypic effects. Um, hmm. And, but anyway, he, he was also an, uh, the lead, the senior author on a paper uh, just a few years ago, about 10 years ago now, where they took two different wild type uh, variants of mitochondrial DNA and combined them in the same embryo. And that led okay. to all sorts of like metabolic and cognitive defects and uh this was a mouse okay. uh, a mouse study and so they found that you don't even have to have like a selfish copy of mitochondrial dna you could just have genetic heterogeneity you know you just mm. combine different non-identical uh sequence variants of mitochondrial dna in the same embryo and that can already be uh, deleterious and so rather than saying that like uniparental inheritance evolved to curtail the spread of selfish mitochondrial DNA, it could be mm. as simple as it evolved to uniparental inheritance evolved to, um, to, to minimize the amount of 
genetic variation among different copies of mitochondrial DNA in the same organism. Because there seems to be something about okay. mixing this genetic variation within the same cell that can have inherently deleterious effects, even if those genetic variants on their own in their own separate embryos are completely neutral. Okay, that's really cool. That's very interesting. I did not know that. I had read that that older paper, which sort of, as you mentioned, gave sort of the the this kind of the broad strokes of you. But yeah, uh, that is really interesting. I was unaware of that. So that's really cool. I, mitochondria is not. I'm an organismal person, and so I'm typically more sort of broad strokes, like a zoology sort of stuff. That is really cool. I like that. Um, it's and uh, sort of jumping on that as well as something else you said earlier. It's um, it's sort of eye opening when you start going through the literature and really realizing just you said like just how easy it is for DNA to change and for DNA to cause mm -hmm. phenotypic changes, which then have these ecological uh, impacts. And it's it's like way easier than you would think if you just listen to the likes of Jason Lyle or Georgia Purdom or, you know. Those guys. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's what's so fascinating. That's why I love those, like, uh, the long term experiments with different, you know, like flies or, or E. coli or something or yeast. Um, uh, I, I had a guy on um, William Ratcliffe who does yeast experiments. And so they actually evolved these unicellular, yeast unicellular, or the Saccharomyces cerevisiae is unicellular into a multicellular phenotype. And they kept grow, uh, selecting it. From there, and it became macroscopic, which is also yeah, the uh, snowflake really yeast. Yeah, yeah, and it's like the changes that are required, the genetic changes required, are very simple, right? You don't have to redo everything or move everything around and make a bunch of new genes. It's like that's not required at all. It's just change a few things here and there, tweak a few things, and you know, there you go. Right. Yeah. And so it, it makes. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so I was just going to say, it looks like you have a question in the in the oh. chat, uh, or there is a question in the chat, although um, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. In, in uh, my window, it says private chat. Peter, uh, can you bring up uh, Smitty's question? What if the mitochondria are closely related, like a mom and an aunt? Uh, do you want to have at it? Have at it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, it, it it's a little complicated because uh, there's a lot we, we don't know about, like, um, well, so it's not... Let me put it this way. There's um, a huge variety of different effects. Like, you know, um, you could have, like, a mutation happen within a single organism where, other than that one mutation, the molecule of mitochondrial DNA is identical to the other molecules floating around in the same cell. Mm. Uh, and, and yet that can still have deleterious effects. So in one respect... Uh, you could almost say that it doesn't really matter how closely related two individuals are because mm. like any mutation that, that happens at any time could lead to some deleterious effects. However, generally, that's kind of like an exception that proves the rule because like generally speaking, uh, there does seem to be a... a there, there is at least some literature that suggests that relatedness has a role to play. So you mentioned that you're uh, more of like an organismal person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to try and um, blow your mind a little bit on how mitochondria Ooh. actually relates to organismal biology in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, but to get back to Smitty's question, uh, there there is some, some literature that suggests that um, mitochondrial DNA you know, is implicated, well, because of the mutations that can happen in mitochondrial DNA, mitochondria are implicated in the types of genetic incompatibilities that can lead to reproductive isolation. Mm. And so mitochondria and, and discussion of mitochondria shows up a lot in the speciation literature. So like mm. different animals can, or different populations of animals can diverge, you know, towards becoming different species because mitochondrial and nuclear DNA have different um, inheritance patterns, you know, like I, like I said, there's the relaxed replication of mitochondrial DNA. And so just the population dynamics of mitochondrial DNA is so different from the nuclear DNA. You know, okay. mitochondrial DNA doesn't really follow uh, Gregor Mendel's laws of inheritance. You know, you can't do mm. 
Punnett, Punnett squares with mitochondrial DNA. And mm -hmm. so because of these different inheritance patterns and these different population dynamics, you can have a, um, an asymmetrical buildup where you might have mutations in the mitochondrial DNA of one population that makes those mitochondria no longer compatible with the nuclear DNA of this other population. Okay. And, that's interesting. Um, and, and so what they, what that's called is, uh, I mean, there's different ways to put it, but there's uh, something called cytoplasmic incompatibility or, um, okay. or, or mito mitonuclear incompatibility uh, just refers to like the, the DNA in the cytoplasm is not compatible with the DNA in the nucleus of like, you know, if you were to try to, generate a hybrid cross between two populations. Um, but what, sorry, the reason I brought that up uh, to get to Smitty's question is that like that example kind of presupposes that there is a relationship between relatedness or that there is like an association between relatedness and how mm -hmm. deleterious it can be to combine uh, the mitochondrial DNA with like the rest of the cell or with the nucleus of another population because um, it, it, it seems to be that the more distantly related two populations are, right? Like the, the further down the road they are towards um, speciation, mm -hmm. then the more likely it is you're going to see deleterious effects if you try to combine the mitochondria with the, from this population with the nucleus of this population. That's awesome. Uh, I just made a note so, about that on my phone, so that's what I was doing so I can read about that later. Yeah, uh, there's a paper... Uh, in the journal G3, um, it I can, I can share, I assume I can share links in the, like the chat window. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, oh, feel free to let me know if that doesn't show up or if yeah, you can't click it on showed it. Up. But, okay. Yeah, so this paper is cytoplasmic nuclear incompatibility between wild isolates of Cinerhabditis neuroguensis. Uh, oh, so Cinerhabditis neuroguensis is is a, a a little roundworm very similar to C. elegans, you know, the common mm -hmm. research organism. And it's they did exactly the type of research that I was just describing, where like they take different populations of this animal that are isolated from different geographic regions, and they gen they generate crosses in a way in a very controlled oh. way so that they know that they're combining the nucleus of this population with the mitochondria of this population. And they see that the hybrids have reduced fitness. And that's uh, really so that's, cool. Um, at least one example where you can say, okay, the, the less closely related they are because they come from different geographic regions, the more likely it is that there's going to be some incompatibilities and that the mitochondria plays some role in that. Very nice. That's awesome. That's really cool. And thank you, Peter, for sharing that in the uh, live chat. That's really cool. I'll have to, I'll take a look at that later. I actually, I just started um, this past week reading uh, Speciation by uh, Coin and Orr, so their big magnum opus. And uh, while I'm not entirely sure how I feel about the reality of the species concept, I do think it's really, uh, I really am enjoying their book so far. And speciation in general is just a, a fascinating topic. And uh, who knows, maybe one day I can, uh, you know, participate in that sort of stuff. But yeah, that's, that is really cool. I do like that. I haven't participated in that study or, or any sort of speciation work myself either. But um, I, you know, the, the, the leader author on that study interviewed in uh, the lab that I was doing my PhD. He, he interviewed for a postdoc in the same lab. So that's how I came across his work. Um, but it's okay. so it's like adjacent to my field but not exactly what i do um uh there was a, a paper i read about um was about uh Elegans recently uh just sort of in the same vein but in this study they were uh in, it was from like 2009 i think something like that where they were uh doing they were mutating these C. elegans and as a result their uh sex determination system changed so yeah. instead of having their their normal uh sets of chromosomes they were mutating certain genes which then began acting like or so or they would mutate a gene on a certain on a different chromosome and then that chromosome would start acting like a sex chromosome you know whereas it wasn't before 
and and uh, oh, then like fragments of chromosomes were also being used as sex determinants and all sorts of stuff. It was uh, it was crazy. I guess I can uh, I could try to find that. It was called like pushing the envelope. Um, well, let's see if I can, if I can spell correctly. That's the other. Um, that's the other problem is being able to spell correctly. Uh, oh, exploring the envelope. Here we go. Yep. Okay. Um, da -da -da -da. I'll put it here in our little secret chat, and then Peter can move it to the live chat. Okay. There we go. Oh, perfect. Yeah. This one. So one of the professors I work for is a um, is a herpetologist, and his research is predominantly oh, cool. with. Um, so, so rather removed from from nematodes, but his his research is in um, like sex determination system, or a lot of his research is in like sex determination that sort of stuff. And so he came across yeah. the paper because it's from a few years ago. Has he done any work on? But yeah, on, it's a really like, interesting paper. Temperature dependent sex determination. I haven't um, read much of his stuff. The only stuff of his okay. I've read was a um, he discovered. Uh, or he like laid out the phylogenetics for these frogs in um in Africa. They're uh they're called rain frogs. You guys may have seen the videos of them. They're the the ones that like they're like, like the little almost spherical frogs, and they make this noise like me. You know they they scream really loudly. Uh, and it's like um oh man, now I'm forgetting the name of that one too. Is this what happens when you get old, Peter? This, this is what happens if you hang around uh, me a lot. You keep forgetting things. <laughs> I have that all the time. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Breviceps ombelinonga. That's what it's called. Um, and that's easy yeah, to remember. Named by... yeah. <laughs> Breviceps ombelinonga. Named Nielsen et al. 2020. And so, um, yeah, I haven't read a whole lot of his research, but he's he's a cool guy. I like him a lot. Um, very cool but yeah so he does the sex determination stuff but yes so, uh to your point though yeah the um the whole bit about um using temperature to uh, in the sex determination system that's that's really interesting because a lot of it's that's evolved independently like a bunch of different times which is kind of yeah neat. it even uh, happens in c elegans um like uh so, so c elegans are like normally hermaphroditic and uh which like genetically like on a cellular level they're a sexually reproducing organism it just so happens that the same individual produces the sperm and the egg and then um fertilizes its own eggs with its own sperm and uh so like they it's called selfing where they just self-fertilize but if you want to like do a genetic cross then you need males that can um, fertilize the the embryos from one of these hermaphrodites, and uh, one of the ways to get males is to incubate the uh, the C. elegans at a warmer temperature. So you take like one of the food plates and you stick it at like thirty degrees for a few hours, and then um, and then they, you know, a couple days later you'll have some males on the plate. So. Yeah. That is really cool. I think they, um, they talked about that in the paper also, I believe. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, uh, sex is very strange. It's very strange. <laughs> yeah. I've yep. had to read a lot of uh, literature related to uh, sexual reproduction and the evolution of sex recently, and it's all very strange. Mm. The One of the sort of burgeoning fields within... Um, I guess sexual selection is like neuroethology or ethology, however you pronounce it, uh, where mm -hmm. the researchers are looking at, at the neurological basis for why organisms have certain behaviors. And so, mm -hmm. like, what's going on in the frog's head when he sees a fly? What's going on in his head when he sees a lily pad? You know, that sort of stuff. And there are some, you know, there are a few experiments, or there are some you know, here and there which look at that kind of stuff where the researchers will, like, actually... You know, peel back the frog's head and see like which nerves are being are hyperpolarizing or whatever. 
uh, mm. <laughs> when the frog sees Stimulus X. And that stuff is really cool, in my opinion. I'd love to see that kind of stuff yeah. with humans, but, you know, humans seem to not want to be part of those studies. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no one no, wants to volunteer sense. for some reason. <laughs> right, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, there's... I mean, there's a bunch of like different angles of how and why sexual reproduction evolved in the first place, and like in some ways it kind of seems paradoxical because like you're, you know, uh, kind of like decreasing the effective population size because if you have like a hundred individuals, you don't have a hundred reproducers now; you have fifty, so to speak. Right. Uh, right, the twofold like, cost of males and all that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason why two... So, sorry, I'm reading a question that oh, came up. Oh, no, go the, ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there question, a reason why two different individual, or sorry, two different variants of mitochondria is deleterious? Uh, is this related to the electron transport chain? Yeah, so uh, the reasons are not completely known, but... Uh, I would say it probably does have something to do with the electron transport chain. The only proteins encoded by the mitochondrial DNA are uh, protein subunits of the electron transport chain. And um, that's at least in animal mitochondrial DNA. I couldn't speak to plant mitochondrial DNA. I know plant mitochondrial DNA is a lot bigger, like the mitochondrial genome's bigger in plants than it is in animals. Um, and there's really interesting potential evolutionary reasons. Well, I mean, there's evolutionary reasons why, but the reasons mm. are really interesting. So I'm just going to put a pin in that in case we have potential to explanations. To the, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the, so, so it's over the course of evolution, a lot of genes from the mitochondrial DNA have become, have migrated and become translocated to the nucleus and are, now expressed in the nucleus and then imported, like the proteins are imported back into the mitochondria. And um, there's a, a bunch of reasons why it should work that way, like why evolution would favor a lot of these genes being encoded in the nuclear DNA. Uh, you know, the nuclear DNA tends to have a lower mutation rate. Um, and, and like I was talking about earlier, it's uh, the mitochondrial DNA is more prone to selfish proliferation if it acquires certain mutations that disrupt mitochondrial function. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why it can be adaptively beneficial to bring, to bring genes into the nucleus. Um, so in, in a certain respect, you could say like the host cell has kind of like domesticated the mitochondrial genome a little bit or to mm -hmm. a certain degree. Um, that being said though, uh, to get back to this question, the, um, the electron transport chain appears to play a role, but like, we don't really know why, uh, it, you know, one possibility is just that you, um, that just that the cell is more sensitive to, okay, so let me back up. The nuclear, part of the reason I brought up the whole fact that like genes have moved over to the nucleus is that the electron transport chain now, um, almost all of the, all, all but one of the enzymes in the electron transport chain is composed of protein subunits that are encoded by both the nucleus and the mitochondrial DNA. Hmm. And so you have these two different genomes and one in the nucleus and one that's all around in the mitochondria. They are encoding proteins that actually physically interact. And so there could be something about this physical interaction between proteins encoded by these two different genomes that could be more sensitive to uh, genetic variation within the cell. And we don't, we don't really know why. Uh, okay. Very interesting. You put, you put mitochondria from different species. Uh, you could, but it would probably, I would almost guarantee that it would be very deleterious. I mean, even closely members, even, even like, you know, um, like in that uh, in that Labelza paper that I shared um, earlier on, you know, you can combine mitochondria from different geographically isolated populations of the same species, and even there you can get deleterious effects. And so, if if there's been enough time for speciation to really occur, then I would think even more so that you're going to have some deleterious genetic incompatibilities. 
that that crop up there. I like how sanitized deleterious sounds. Like I wouldn't recommend doing that. It would be deleterious. You know, I just right, like the yeah. <laughs> that was very interesting. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to lob them at Brian. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. <laughs> um. Oh yeah. In the meantime. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, you had something. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, yeah, we uh, we'll go back to our our Turek show next week unless we have somebody um who we're interviewing so we we also we do a show uh where we are like watching a video by frank Tarek and we like pause it respond and then like okay play you know listen to a little bit yeah. nope <laughs> we, we go back to frank yeah. Turek unless we have someone more interesting than frank Turek, which is pretty much everyone else on the planet it's a very low bar <laughs> yeah i actually had um I had I had coffee with Frank Turek uh, a couple couple years ago. Um, really? He came. Yeah, he came to speak at uh, at Vanderbilt when I was in grad school there. Um, and uh, so I, w I was actually the president of the Secular Student Alliance at Vanderbilt that year. And so, like a bunch of the different religious student groups got together, and we got an invitation to have dinner with him. And then we went out for coffee afterwards. Um, I yeah. I feel like I would have a really hard time. Uh, being polite i i feel like i just have to ask like why why do you speak that'd be my one question it's like excuse me sir but just why do you speak why do you talk <laughs> about things you obviously don't understand <laughs> like he's a little he's a little, he's a little bit i i think i'm well i mean he's off the cuff when the cameras aren't on but like um when when he's not following a script, it it seems like he's a little bit more, I think, incredulous. Like I, we, he was asking like me and some of the other people that were there at the table, like what are, what are we studying, mm. and like the topic of evolution came up, and he was kind of like, "Do you really believe in this? Come on, you know." That's uh, well, so I I agree with that because um, there's a debate between him and and. Uh, Jeff Louder and highly recommend watching it if, if you haven't or if anybody in the chat hasn't um, because so they have you know it's a does God exist and they have their opening statements and whatever well they get to a part where they have they basically um, one of them gets to ask the other questions the other person has to respond and so in that section um, <laughs> uh, Jeff just is like all right so hypothetically let's say this and he you know, it's kind of leading Frank with his questions and Frank's just kind of like, oh, like, oh, I don't want to answer this. Hmm. <laughs> but it, it, he says things like, um, like one of the quotes uh, from, I think it was, was it last? No, week before last, I think. Anyway, uh, is Frank says, evolutionists almost never talk about plants. So that's not true. One of the, uh, so I happen to have TA'd Botany Lab uh, multiple times. Uh, and okay for a botanist who is published on plant evolution so uh i don't know you know <laughs> nobody talks about plants over here i guess yeah uh, apparently cytoplasmic male sterility is a big source uh, or thought to be a, a source of speciation in plants and mm. uh, that's where so like because of maternal inheritance of the cytoplasmic genomes like especially mitochondria um, mm. it means that the male lineage is like an evolutionary dead end every generation because it doesn't pass on its mitochondria and so uh, the the evolutionary like consequence of that is that there is less that you you would say that there's relaxed selection um, preventing there. there the selection that would prevent the buildup of deleterious mutations uh, that are like specifically male harming has been relaxed. Uh, and so like mutations that are either beneficial or neutral in females, but deleterious in males, there's not as much natural selection preventing the buildup of those mutations because you know, the males aren't passing on their DNA anyway. Um, 
So all that is to say, like, there's examples of, there's a, there's a lot of examples in the literature of mutations that are neutral or even beneficial in uh, females, but then have a deleterious effect in males. And mm. uh, in plants, the, there's this phenomenon of cytoplasmic male sterility, where like a male can be, just as the name suggests, a male can be rendered um, sterile by, you know, something in the cytoplasm, apparent, you know, apparently the mitochondrial DNA. Um, and because, you know, the mitochondrial DNA in, well, the chloroplasts have their own DNA as well, but like these are the only sources of hereditary material in the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And so if you see something that's not in the nucleus, that's in the cytoplasm, that's, you know, has some evolutionary effect, like, you know, male sterility, for example, then um, it starts to look very, very clearly like, oh, this might be a mitochondrial effect. Um, and in some cases, the mitochondrial mutations have even been identified, or at least like it's been pinpointed that yes, this is something coming from the mitochondria. But all that is to say, that's not true. That um, evolutionary biologists don't look at plants. Like what? Yeah, they do. I, I, we've done multiple videos on this channel about the evolution of different plant groups. So we did a whole video on the evolution of flowers. We did one where we sort of overviewed uh, plant evolution, and we have more that we'll do later on um, in this. So we're doing an Ancestors Tale series. You ever read the, the Ancestors Tale by Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong? I haven't read that one. Okay, no. it's a really good book, but uh, we're going through it chapter by chapter, so it goes through evolutionary history, but backwards. And so uh, we are 21 episodes into it now out of like 60. <laughs> Because I'm okay. a glutton for punishment, yeah. um, and so we're uh, we're at like what's it ninety? Mil we're at our common ancestor with like uh, the next tale is the sloth's tale. So our common ancestor with sloths of like ninety million years ago, um, and so eventually, you know, we'll get to the the plants, right? And so we'll have a bit about the evolution of plants and all that sort of stuff. And nope, just doesn't happen. Just not real. No one worries about it. No one does any research on plants. Yeah. It's um, um, Smitty's right. Yeah, where are the plant kinds or creation trying to come up with the fun with fungi kinds? Yeah, that's true. It's the the only kinds that really exist are the things we care about. Or the you know the your sort of barn animal things like humans are kind, you got cat kind, dog kind, cow kind. But like other than that, it's it's just all over the place. You know. Uh, anyway, uh. We also have a question from Nestlig saying um, he uh, says he would like he would imagine that the electron transport chain is maintained by a specific uh, or maintained by specific expression levels of nuclear and uh, mitochondrial electron transport chain uh, protein genes. And so perhaps different variants cannot be supported by the same expression patterns. So one always loses uh, or you get oxidative stress. Does that sound right to you or? Um, it's, I think it's at least, it, it, I mean, it sounds reasonable. Uh, okay. Gotcha. We, we do have other examples where there appears to be some relationship between like an altered expression pattern and a deleterious mitochondrial effect. Mm. Um, in my first paper in grad school, we were looking at the, um, some of the phenotypic effects of this a mutated copy of mitochondrial DNA that has like a large deletion in it. So it was actually missing several genes. Mm. And uh, the, the electron transport chains involve, well, the electron transport chain um, enzymes, I should say, involve the, um, these proteins that have to interact, not only physically interact, but like they have to interact in stoichiometric proportions, uh, you know, which means that, like numerical proportions, you can't have, you know, one enzyme composed of one copy from of this protein from the nucleus and one copy of this protein from the mitochondria, and then this other copy of the same enzyme has a two to one ratio of those same proteins. Like it doesn't work that way. Mm. Um, and so, if you really mess around with uh, gene expression in the mitochondria, 
then that can lead to, you know, potentially, you know, all the all the signs point to that can lead to um, either a buildup of like misfolded proteins because they don't they're being made in in like asymmetric proportions. So like all the pro not all the proteins have their binding partner, and so maybe they become unfolded and build up, and it leads to what we would call proteotoxic stress. Uh, so that's one thing that can potentially happen. Um, it, I'm completely speculating to say that that could be a reason why heteroplasmy or just you know the, the state of having different non-identical copies of mitochondrial DNA in the same cell is deleterious. Like we know that it has deleterious effects, but again, it's kind of speculative at this point in the like where we are in the history of the field, it's a little mm. speculative to try to figure out or to try to say why why that is. Okay, very cool. Uh, and yep, yep, you guys, feel free to keep uh, putting questions in there. Uh, do you have like future directions that you want to go with your uh, research? Yeah. So, um, so I'm really interested, or like I'm really fascinated generally speaking, by like the question of how do different evolutionary forces combine? And, you know, there's a bunch of different directions you can go with that. But, you know, one example is that the, the same mutation or the same set of mutations might have a variety of different fitness effects. And so it's not just a simple question of is natural selection favoring this mutation or not? It's, you know, it could be favoring that mutation in one respect and not favoring it in another. And selfish genetic elements is one example. So natural selection, like on a very microscopic level, I don't mean like microevolution, but I mean like on a really small, like molecular level, natural selection can be favoring this particular mutation. But then mm. if that, comes at the expense of the fitness of the organism, then you have a situation where natural selection is favoring this mutation at one level of biological organization, and it's disfavoring the same mutation at some other level of biological organization. And mm -hmm. so if you were to try to zoom out to the whole population and say, what are the dynamics of that mutation? Is it increasing in frequency or is it decreasing in frequency or, you know, what frequency should we expect to see that mutation, you know, um, stably persisting at that's going you know answers answering that kind of question is going to come down to uh, trying to figure out quantitatively how do these different evolutionary forces um, combine and you know what's the what's the overall net effect another example would be mutation and selection itself so um, different types of mutations can happen at different rates and and then, of course, different mutations can have different fitness effects. And so one, you know, question that's being explored, and I, I started to work on this in, in my postdoctoral fellowship just since finishing grad school, um, is the question of, like, how do the forces of variation in, you know, the probability of different types of mutations and the variation in the different fitness effects, how do those different evolutionary forces combine? You know, to give you one example, like in so cancer is an evolutionary um, is an evolutionary process, right? Because it takes a combination of mutations and natural selection at the cellular level to convert like a normal, healthy somatic cell into a cancer cell. Um, and hmm. what they've what what they found, uh, and I believe this is especially true from the work by Jeffrey Townsend at, uh, at, I think he's at Yale. He's a, a cancer evolutionary biologist. So like he studies the evolutionary um, forces that are at work in the development of cancer cells. Uh, and one thing they found is that mutations that are observed most common are not the mutations that have the largest fitness effects with, you know, for the cancer cell. Uh, and okay. the reason is because a mutation can maybe have a slightly suboptimal fitness effect from natural selection point of view, but that mutation might have a much higher probability. And so it just happens more often. And that's why it's seen more often. Okay. Um, 
And there's a lot of examples of this type of thing in many, many examples, or sorry, in many, many, many different contexts. So like there's examples of the evolution of um, viruses to like antiviral drugs, the evolution of insects and, um, and, and fungus to like anti-pestis or to, to, you know, pesticide resistance. Mm. Um, there's examples of like birds that have adapted to live at higher altitude where there's been mutations in their hemoglobin that are adaptive, but the mutations also have occurred at mutation hotspots where, you know, the, there's, sorry, these are just different examples, but like the, the point is oh, the yeah. same where like there's many, many different um, instances and contexts where we see that um, the the mutations that are actually showing up in like real world examples of adaptive evolution are being driven by some combination of um, the fitness effect, but also the probability effect. And so, you know, that's just another way of saying you can't predict the outcome of evolution just from knowing mm. which mutations are going to have the strongest fitness effect because, you know, the, the direction of evolution is also somewhat driven by just variation between different types of mutations with respect to how often they happen. So there's okay. a there's a probability okay. distribution of different types of mutations, and and then layered on top of that, there's the fitness effects, and so like the outcome of evolution is going to be some combination of those different influences. And I know you probably already know all this stuff, like how, yeah, of course mutations can happen at different rates and they can have different fitness effects, but like it's still not clear like whether there's um, well understanding like quantitatively how do these uh, effects come together is still not really clear. Mm. So, okay. uh, yeah, the, the paper that we have been working on most recently is um, looking at like statistical correlations between the mutation rate, which is just to say, if you were to look at all the different types of mutations that could possibly happen, you know, what's the rate or, or how often do they each happen like in a naive population? And then there's the fitness effects, right? And so if you were to plot out like, you know, a whole bunch of different mutations on a two dimensional plot where one axis is mutation rate. Mm -hmm. So the mutations on one end of the axis are happen much more often than at the other end. And then the other axis is uh, the fitness effects. You're going to get some sort of a, of a landscape of different types of mutations that could happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but then over the course of evolution, you know, the adaptive, the process of adaptation is going to favor mutations that happen both more often and mutations that have a higher positive fitness effect, right? And so you're going to get some transformation of this landscape from the space of possibilities to the space of actual outcomes. And, and that's going to like kind of transform the shape of that landscape. And so we're kind of, that's kind of what we're looking at is, you know, just the, what does the process of adaptation do to the you know like the mathematical relationships between the probability that a mutation is going to happen and what its uh, fitness effect is likely to be very cool that's really interesting well, i look forward to uh reading about that when you post it on uh i don't know twitter or whatever rises from the ashes of twitter as it uh you know <laughs> right, yeah. sinks into oblivion as we speak um i guess uh since we're at at an hour um i'll lob one more question at you and this also comes from Nestlig. Nestlig says mm -hmm. uh, longevity seems to correlate with protein translation fidelity. I've heard that mitochondria are also related with aging uh, from Nick Lane but I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, oh boy do I. <laughs> okay um, yeah. Yeah so um, mitochondria are definitely implicated in aging. Um, there's so oh. I don't, I don't even know where to begin on that one. Sorry. Um, I, I guess it's probably worth saying first that there's a trade off between uh, how the, how an organism allocates its resources. Right. So yeah. I'll start with the example of the, of the nematode C. elegans. Uh, one of the reasons why this is such an ideal model organism to do uh, to use for the type of research that I did in grad school, and uh, my my graduate work was in C. elegans, and um, 
one of the reasons why it's such an ideal system or ideal model system for that type of work is because it has, from the mitochondria's point of view, it has a humongous germline. You know, so this little microscopic roundworm, over 90% of the mitochondrial DNA in the whole organism is contained in the female germline, which is precisely where you know, the mitochondrial mutations are competing for transmission to the next generation. And so like when we, when we detect uh, some evolutionary process happening across a population of nematodes or, you know, across a population of C. elegans uh, with respect to like its mitochondrial DNA, you know, if we see, for example, across a population over a certain time interval, we see a change in the mutant frequency of a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. Much of that signal, you know, the majority of that signal that we're detecting reflects the biology of the female germline, uh, you know, which again is where these mutations are competing for transmission to the next generation. So that's really relevant for evolutionary, for addressing evolutionary um, questions. And part of the, uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because like it sort of, uh, I, I think it kind of illustrates how metabolically expensive the process of reproduction is, right? Like there's a reason that plants, flowering plants tend to produce flowers in the springtime because that's when the days are getting longer, right? So like, you know, from a photosynthesis point of view, it's, it's the time of year where a plant can afford to invest a lot of energy in flowers and then, you know, fruit and seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in the worm, we see a similar effect where like most of the mitochondria that that worm's body is producing is in the female germline getting ready to go into the next generation. Right. And what we find is that if you were to prevent the development of the germline, so like there are mutations that you can uh, cross into a nematode where as it develops to an adult, it won't grow a germline, just it won't have a female gonad. It'll be like a worm that's entirely somatic tissue. So it's almost like a, a genetic mutation that sterilizes the worm basically. Okay. And the, um, the effect of this is that the worms actually live longer. And uh, there's actually oh, a whole bunch okay. of other similar examples. Excuse me. Um, one, what, one good example is that the, um, the insulin receptor. So like when an, when an animal eats food, you know, its uh, body secretes growth hormone because it's physiologically, the, the organism is physiologically responding to the presence of nutrients that signals to the other cells in the body that, hey, there's nutrients that need to be broken down. And, you know, the, the cells, you know, respond to that by making mitochondria, making enzymes that, that you know, uh, break down the nutrients, right? And, uh there's a whole bunch of cellular pathways that are involved in making more cells, right? Like the, the cell division cycle is regulated by pathways mm -hmm. that are sensitive to the nutrient environment of the organism. So that if the organism is encountering starvation conditions, then it tends to conserve the resources that it has because it's not physio it's not physiologically appropriate for that organism to um, respond as though there's plenty of nutrients if it's actually encountering starvation conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the the so the reason I wanted to bring that up is because actually when they um, they found that the the insulin receptor in the nematode in C. elegans when you mutate it, the worms actually live twice as long on average, um, hmm. and so. The, there, there's a particular type of, of mutation for which this is true, um, but the the insulin receptor rate, it's just this protein that's sitting on the cell surface that, you know, uh, binds to the the growth hormone. It's an insulin. It's called a, it's an insulin-like growth hormone in C. elegans, and and so this protein binds to the hormone in like a lock and key sort of way, 
and um, basically these worms live twice as long if you um, mutate the insulin receptor so that the insulin signaling pathway doesn't work. And the reason why is because these worms are now um, kind of like locked in a state of uh, physiologically behaving as though they're starving, even though the, there may be plenty of food around. Hmm. Okay. And, Interesting. Um, so to get back to, to uh, Nestle's question, like, yeah, there's a ton, there's a ton of trade-offs between reproduction and um, aging and and uh, well in in the case of Nestle's question about protein translation fidelity that seems to be one of the um, you know one one of the uh, what do you call it it's like one of the contributing factors of this more like big picture phenomenon I've been trying to, to talk mm. about you know if you make it so that the the animal can't develop a germline it has to reallocate those resources in other ways right and so one of the uh, one of the things that that's been found is that in these animals with these with this uh, mutated insulin receptor that you know like i said live twice as long they also have a smaller germline and they produce fewer offspring they lay fewer eggs um, and they store more fat in their somatic tissue so like one of the you know, one of the metabolic switches that happens is that these organisms are like reallocating resources that would have gone towards the um, the inflation of the germline and the production of offspring is now being reallocated towards uh, the somatic tissue. And hmm. like from an evolutionary point of view, this makes perfect sense, right? Because like living things go where the nutrients are, right? And they have to be able to survive till they get there. And that you know, it's easy to think of that in like uh, a spatial sense, like an organism is going to migrate to the other side of the Petri dish if that's where the food is. Mm. But this is also true in the fourth dimension, right? If the nutrients aren't here now, but they'll be here tomorrow, then the organism has to be able to survive until then. Right. And so that's, it's kind of, you know, evolutionarily, it's kind of a survival mechanism to if you encounter starvation conditions, the adaptive thing for the genome to do is to be able to rewire its metabolism in a way that conserves resources so that, you know, hopefully somewhere down the line, you know, in the future, when you encounter nutrient conditions again, well, then you can start to invest those resources towards reproduction. And so there's kind of this um, okay. trade-off, at least in, it, the story gets more complicated in more complicated organisms like mammals and especially humans. Yeah. Um, but like, it, in, at least in a in a sort of a simple big picture sense, there's there's kind of this trade off between, uh, you know, the w with respect to metabolism between reproduction and uh, longevity, and um, you know, and, and so one of the one of the drivers for that seems to be protein quality control, and so like for example, if you mess okay. with the um, the ability to make protein in the mitochondria in these uh, neat little balanced ways where you have, you know, every protein has its binding partner with the protein that's encoded with, by the nucleus. If you mess with that balance, then you can get, um, you know, deleterious effects. And the flip side of that is if you have, if you maintain protein quality control where you're making the proteins in the amounts that are necessary, not more, not less. And, you know, if, if uh, proteins start to misfold, then they get degraded rather than accumulating. You know, mm. those are all the sorts of, of um, physiological um, processes that, as long as they continue that way, then there's no real damage that's building up that's going to lead to the, the rapid aging or disease of the organism. Okay. I, that's a Very huge oversimplification. Like biology is complex, right? Um, biology is complex. It, but that's a, uh, that's okay. At least the gist of it. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, we've kept you now for uh, just over an hour. Uh, and usually when we do our interviews, we just do. Uh, we just go about an hour. I realize I forgot to say that uh, <laughs> before we jumped in. Uh, so, are there any uh, final thoughts you want to give, or anything you want to mention? Or, uh, or want to plug or anything like that? Yeah, one other thing. Um, yeah. So going back to the thing you said about um, organismal biology. Hmm. So I think I covered uh, speciation and how hmm. mitochondria plays a role in that. Um, 
And of course, there's the paradox of the organism and mitochondria plays a lot of roles in mm -hmm. like um, disease. And one of the causes of genetic disease is selfish, selfish genetic elements that are you know over replicating to the detriment of the organism. Mm -hmm. One other thing um, that I wanted to mention that um, you might find really interesting being someone interested in um, in organismal biology is the evolution of the animal germline. And okay. so um, there's, you know, different ways to make a germline, right? And one way is that an organism can grow up and then it can take some of its somatic tissue and convert those into gametes, right? And that's how plants work. Like a plant can grow up into this huge adult organism mm -hmm. and then it produces flowers. And from those flowers, it produces gametes. Right. Um, and uh, basal, basal animals that are like, you know, glued to the sea floor uh, can, can work in kind of a similar way, but really motile animals uh, like you and me and nematodes, uh, these animals all have uh, a developmental trajectory that involves setting aside cells very early in development that mm. are going to become the germline for the next generation. And... Uh, that that difference of like sequestering cells really early on in embryonic development and saving them to become the eventual germline when that organism is an adult, you know, one of the mm. benefits of that is that it enables those mitochondria that are in those cells to undergo a prolonged period of quiescence, where those cells are not um, replicating their mitochondrial DNA and that they're not uh, accumulating new mutations mm. and so there's there's an uh, an evolutionary benefit that is um, it's especially evolutionarily beneficial for organisms that have a high mitochondrial mutation rate, right? So um, hmm. motile animals, for example, that have a high respiration rate, are going to you know replicate their mitochondrial DNA a whole bunch. They're going to have a lot of metabolic demand on their mitochondria, and they're going to have a high mitochondrial uh, DNA mutation rate. And so for for these uh, for, for animals that, you know, have a high mitochondrial DNA mutation rate, the adaptive thing to do, even if it, even if your biology didn't work out this way initially, the adaptive thing to do is to um, evolve a, a method of development that involves setting aside cells early on in development to become the germline. And when you do that, when you, when you have this phenomenon called early germline sequestration, mm. that can actually, um, uh, it, it is thought that that can actually promote the uh, the evolution of the non-germline cells, you know, and, and um, you know, being able to differentiate the somatic tissue into multiple different tissue types uh, is is thought to be one of the sort of trickle down effects of having a high mitochondrial DNA mutation rate and having cells that are set a set aside for early uh, germline development um, early on in, in development. Uh, Okay. What's the point of all of this? The, the point of all of this is that uh, animal complexity and the evolution of animal complexity, specifically the relationship between the germline and the somatic tissue and the diversity of somatic tissue. Uh, there's a lot of theoretical uh, work that suggests that this may have been driven by uh, adap adaptation to minimize the deleterious, the buildup of deleterious mutations in mitochondrial DNA. So hmm. long story short, okay. um, mitochondrial DNA appears to have played a central role in the evolution of sexual reproduction, mm -hmm. uh, animal development and complexity, uh, the evolution of complex multicellularity and speciation. So it's, you know, it really plays a lot of central roles in a lot of ways. It's all and in so, there. Yeah. Be thankful for your mitochondria. They have bared a heavy burden across the uh the story of of animal evolution that's awesome that's really cool um well that that is really interesting i'll have to go look up some papers on that now because that was again something else i hadn't really uh looked at before uh so i want to say uh thank you for coming on and uh telling us about your research and uh all this other really cool in 
uh, information. This is all very interesting. And I hope you guys in the uh, side chat will go check out those papers that that uh, Peter put in there. Oh, we have another one. Uh, also, yeah, I just shared a, a, a link left. to uh, the paper I was just talking about that that talks about. It's a. I said it's theoretical work. It's a. It's a. It's a mathematical model that shows that under these conditions of like tissue, oh. certain amount of tissue complexity and a high mitochondrial DNA mutation rate, then you can get evolution to favor in uh, a germline that develops earlier during embryonic development. Pomiankowski and Nicolene. Wow, okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I almost forgot yeah. that. That is a Nicolene paper. Okay. I'll definitely. Yeah. Nestle might like that one then. Uh, okay. Really cool. Oh, I'm going to save this one too now. Alrighty. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. We enjoyed having you. Um, I'll probably see you around on, on Twitter until it, uh, you know, completely sinks. As someone has recently said, um, Right now, um, Twitter is like the Titanic, where we're all making fun of the iceberg, and it's getting really angry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thank you, everybody, in the side chat for watching, and we will see you all next week. So, bye, everybody. Yeah.